Colombia, a country that not too long ago was the world's capital for drugs, violence, and crime. This area, known as Comuna 13, is one of the poorest neighborhoods in the country and was once considered to be the most dangerous neighborhood in the world. You couldn't even walk these streets without getting shot at or killed. You see that nearby mountain over there? That's the largest mass grave in South America. Over 250,000 bodies are buried there. And they're all victims of the senseless violence and crime that was rampant in those days. Today, a lot has changed. The streets are much safer, but having two security guards is still a good idea. The place is alive. People are selling fresh fruits, drinks, t-shirts, ponchos, and souvenirs everywhere. And the poor neighbors are dancing in the streets, trying to earn a few pesos. And you wouldn't believe this. In the middle of all the chaos, the dancing and the music playing in the background, Someone is holding an old torn sitter, covering his eyes and davening. You're probably wondering, what's going on here? And what am I doing here? Well, let me take you back to the beginning of one of the most incredible experiences of my life. A few weeks earlier, Rabbi Shlomo Pfeiffer, who during COVID started a global night seder program called Torah at Twilight, where hundreds of kids log on to Zoom from different parts of the world to learn together, forwarded me an email from a woman named Juby Charnowitz. Juby writes that her son Avrami is friends with one of the boys on this program who lives in Colombia and is the son of a rabbi Elad Villegas, who was a former pastor of a church. And when he discovered Torah and mitzvahs, hundreds of his church members converted with him to Judaism. I couldn't believe what I was reading. I called Juby and asked her if she would arrange a trip to Colombia so that we can document this amazing story. She was more than happy to do it. So there are no direct flights from LA to Colombia, and we have to make a stopover in Miami. After a full day of traveling, we finally arrived. I kept wondering the entire time, what would Rabbi Elad look like? What would he be like? Given his different background, culture, differences in language, I wasn't even sure how we would communicate. But as soon as I walked out of the airport, I saw Rabbi Elad for the first time, and I felt like I had known him forever. He had a warm smile, and just a wonderful way about him. He came to pick us up from the airport with his son Yitzchak and one of the community members who spoke English, Rabbi Yehoshua Litvak. He was going to be our translator. But as soon as we walked out of the airport building, no words were necessary. We burst into dance and song, and it was that moment that set the tone for the entire trip. We loaded the van, and on our drive from the airport, Rabbi Elad gave us a brief history about the first Jews who arrived in Colombia from Spain centuries earlier. Jews had lived in Spain for thousands of years, going back all the way to the times of Golos Bavel. In fact, if you look at the end of Ovadia, the Navi describes how the founding members of the Jewish community in Spain hailed from the most prominent and important families in Yerushalayim, the Golos Yerushalayim Asher Besforad. Spanish Jewry flourished for centuries. They even enjoyed a period known as the Golden Age. That was a time when Jews integrated into Spanish culture and society to the point that they had access to the highest levels of political and military powers. Many Torah giants came out of Spain. The Rif, Rambam, Rush, Rajba, and later the Beis Yosef and the Abarbanel, and the list goes on. 
But sadly, all that came to an end with the Spanish Inquisition. In 1492, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella issued a decree expelling all Jews from Spain, except for those who converted to Christianity. Hundreds of thousands of Jews were forced to leave their homes behind and find refuge in nearby countries. But many of the middle and upper class Jews who enjoyed a comfortable lifestyle didn't want to leave. So they stayed and converted openly to Christianity, but secretly they kept observing Torah and mitzvahs. They're known as the Convertisos, the Muranos. The haunting tune of Kal Nidre dates back to that dark period in our history when the Conversos, the Muranos, would secretly come to Shul Yom Kippur night and ask to be released from their vows to the church so that they can daven on the holiest night of the year with their fellow Yidden. But unfortunately, many of them were found out. They were tortured, persecuted, and burnt at the stake. And eventually it was too dangerous and unbearable for the Muranos to continue living in Spain as secret Jews. And in the early 16th century, Many of them made the dangerous trip across the Atlantic to South America, arriving at the coastal city in Colombia called Cartagena. But even there, they couldn't escape the Inquisition. They were still forced to live openly as Christians. And now, hundreds of years later, their descendants have lost their way. And today, there are millions of our brothers and sisters spread all over Colombia, South America, and beyond. But in recent years, there's been a massive awakening. Their neshamas are suddenly waking up and yearning to come home, which brings us to the incredible story of Rabbi Elad and his community. Rabbi Elad was born as Juan Carlos Villegas in 1976. Crecí en Medellín en una época muy violenta porque Pablo Escobar, que era el jefe del cartel de Medellín, generó una época de mucha violencia y estuve rodeado de toda esa, esa época donde habían bombas, donde los sicarios y muchachos jóvenes del barrio hacían parte de estas organizaciones. La educación de mis padres me ayudó mucho a conservar buenos principios y, y no involucrarme en ese tipo de actividades. Desde un principio yo eh, enseñé a mis hijos que lo principal era la familia. A la edad de 15 años ingresé a una iglesia cristiana evangélica. Me involucré completamente en la iglesia y a la edad de 19 años ya me había convertido en un pastor importante dentro de esa organización. La iglesia creció mucho hasta convertirse en una organización que la conformaban 3,000 miembros. Because the church was evangelical, they were Christian Zionists. So in 1998, they sent them on a tour to Israel to explore and learn about the land, the culture, and the country's connection to Christianity. But what he actually learned on that trip left him totally confused. Pese a descubrir que muchas cosas que tenía nuestra región y nuestra cultura hacían parte de la cultura judía. Cosas arquitectónicas de, los, de las casas típicas de, de, de esta región, como tener un sitio para hacer netilayadaim afuera del baño, eh, o tener eh, mikvaot dentro de las casas, en los patios de las casas. Muchas casas tenían en los marcos de las puertas mesusot ocultas, o inclusive mesusot colocadas dentro de las estatuillas de la Virgen o, o de otras estatuillas católicas, estaban mesusot ocultas allí, prácticas alimenticias como lavarse las manos antes de comer, o cuando se iba a la iglesia, en vez de cubrirse la cabeza como forma de respeto como lo hace el pueblo judío, por el contrario se quitaban el sombrero o lo que tenían cubierto en la cabeza como una manera de saber que ese lugar era un lugar de idolatría. Que demostraban que nosotros veníamos, esos judíos que habían sido exiliados de España por la Inquisición. All signs were pointing towards the Jewish heritage. But as the leader of a massive church with 3,000 followers, he felt he had no choice but to ignore it. He came home and continued preaching and teaching Christianity. One day, he was giving a private lecture to 40 church members on his father's farm. 
After the lecture, he was walking out to his car when suddenly, out of nowhere, a few gang members jumped him from behind. They held him at gunpoint and dragged him into a nearby jungle. Creían que con las finanzas de mi papá y las finanzas de la iglesia podíamos pagar un rescate oneroso en esa en ese momento. Que me habían pedido 100 millones de pesos. Fue pasando el tiempo, nosotros desesperados. Un mes estuvo secuestrado y está prácticamente se enloqueció. Yo estuve demasiado preocupado, no se enfermamos. It was very difficult for Rabbi Alad to talk about his time in captivity. It brought up so many traumatic memories. Fueron días donde empezó mi sufrimiento, porque eran las eh, amenazas constantes de que me iban a matar. Solamente comíamos arroz una vez al día. Era época de mucha lluvia. Y tengo una chaqueta que fue mi cobija. El abrigo mío durante todo ese tiempo. As he spoke about the jacket that kept him warm during captivity, he got up, walked over to the closet, and took out that jacket. And he showed me how he restored it and now wears it once a year on Pesach night, remembering his own slavery. In fact, the only other possession he had with him was a Bible. And every day in captivity, he would read the Psukim that described the pain of Am Yisrael when they were slaves in Mitzrayim and how Hashem heard their cries. That gave him the strength he needed to survive those difficult days. And suddenly he gets up again, and this time he walks over to the bookshelf and takes out a black covered book. It was that Bible. Ver que está rayada y muchas cosas vine aquí a, a leerlas y, y a seguir adelante con todos estos pasajes de Barim eran los que leía constantemente y eh, tenía un lapicero y trataba de, de, de rayar para, para recordar todas las cosas que, que, que tuve la oportunidad en ciertos momentos de leer eh, todas esas cosas fueron las que me daban más fe más ganas de seguir Rabbi Elad's father had gone to school with Pablo Escobar's older brother, Roberto. So he reached out to him to see if he can help him with the negotiations. In the end, they agreed to let him free for a much lower amount than the original price. When Juan Carlos finally came home, he was not the same person that was captured 30 days earlier. Y perdí 20 kilos en ese mes. Vine muy enfermo. La vida de uno estar en manos de otra persona definitivamente es un punto de quiebre, un punto importante para valorar cada minuto, cada instante, lo que enseña nuestros jajamín. Cada mitzvah es sumamente valiosa y es ese momento el que realmente es importante. Porque no sabemos mañana qué va a pasar. It turns out the most difficult moments of his life, when he felt like he was being buried in the jungle and would never make it out alive, in those moments, the seeds of his soul were being planted. And even though his body was weak, his soul was on fire. Así que en el año 2004 regreso a Israel con el objetivo de confrontar mi ideología teológica. Hacer ya las preguntas de rigor. Tuve la oportunidad de preguntarle a rabinos que hablaban en español acerca de estos temas y cuando regreso en el año 2004, definitivamente ya me sentía que estaba predicando mentiras. When Juan Carlos came home, he decided to give one last sermon before he made his final exit. And that was the sermon that changed everything. Rebeza Rodriguez, who today is the assistant rabbi and the soifer of the Kehillah, was part of the church back then, and he vividly remembers that moment that changed his life. Entonces, eh, el rabino Elad, eh, en una reunión normal de la de la iglesia en ese momento, se para frente a toda la comunidad y dice: "Hay algo muy importante que tengo que decirles. Dice: Hasta el momento he tratado de enseñar lo mejor." con el amor, el cariño y con la convicción de lo que creía. Pero hasta este momento me he dado cuenta que lo que he enseñado estaba errado. Por lo tanto, pido perdón por todo lo que he enseñado 
porque no fue mi intención engañar, no fue mi intención causar daño, pero sí definitivamente no es verdad. Sigo como el pastor, el líder de esta iglesia y voy a tomar mi camino y me voy a ir a dedicarme a estudiar judaísmo. La situación es que el público que no se esperaba esas palabras fue una situación de un silencio y un caos, empieza el murmullo de hablar el uno con el otro, quienes lloraron, quienes... Era una confusión total en ese momento particular. We actually went back to where the church used to be in downtown Medellín. Today it's a huge casino. It was Rabbi Elad's first time back. I remember standing there on the busy street corner with mopeds zooming by, music blaring in the background, and I could see Rabbi Elad was struggling to just be there. It almost felt like I was taking a Holocaust survivor back to Europe for the first time since liberation. I asked him whether he wanted to leave, and he said no. We gotta stay and tell the story. He was torn between wanting to forget the past and yet needing to remember it so that he never stops wanting to forget it. Y por sorpresa, una comunidad que era de 3,000 personas, 2,400 personas partieron, pero 600 personas dijeron, nosotros también queremos eso y queremos seguir estudiando. Tiempo muy difícil, porque había dejado de ser cristiano, de ser pastor, pero no era judío y tampoco tenía mucho conocimiento en el judaísmo. Entonces tuvimos que, tuve que empezar a tocar puertas en sinagogas locales, en rabinos locales, pero ninguno de ellos estuvo dispuesto a ayudarnos en ese momento. He rented a building, turned it into a shul, and for three years they learned, studied and reviewed all they needed to know. En el año 2008, finalmente pudimos traer un beidin desde los Estados Unidos que nos permitió hacer conversión. 300 of the original church members made it to the finish line. They were ready to fully commit and become Yidden. They all converted to Judaism. Estuve dos años más en Israel completando mis estudios hasta que recibí mi semijá como rabí y periódicamente viajo a Eretz Israel o a Estados Unidos para seguir estudiando constantemente y así poder trabajar y ofrecerle a la comunidad lo que necesita. Todo ha sido con mucho esfuerzo porque los miembros de la comunidad no son personas ricas, son de clase obrera, clase trabajadora. Tuvimos que comprar Talit, Tefilín, Sidurim, los libros para la sinagoga, el Sefer Torah, pues Rat Hashem, parte de nuestro sueño es construir un gran centro de Torah, no solo para esas 300 personas, sino para albergar a todos aquellos que en diferentes países de Latinoamérica también han venido haciendo conversión al judaísmo. For many years, they didn't have a mikvah. They would risk their lives to go to a nearby river during the night to be tovel. Recently, Rabbi Elad was finally able to raise the funds to build in his backyard a beautiful new kosher mikvah for his community. One of the most moving moments of my entire trip was when Rabbi Elad took me to visit the community cemetery. The law in Colombia doesn't allow for anybody to be buried on private property and it's extremely difficult to get government approval to turn any land into an official cemetery. So Rabbi Elad had no choice but to buy a plot of land in the back of a Christian cemetery. Seeing the large cross at the entrance, walking past all the tombstones decorated with flowers and crosses, broke my heart. I realized how the landscape of the cemetery paralleled the story of the community and the history of the Muranos. On the outside, they seemed Christian, but deep down, there was a Jewish plot. Rabbi Elad told me that his brother was the first one to be buried there. He was born with a severe case of cerebral palsy. He was disabled, he couldn't speak or take care of himself, and he passed away when he was just 37 years old. We walked over to his gravesite and I watched his children cry over the grave, saying to Hillam, it was an emotional experience. Rabbi Elad's wife, Karen, was born as Magnolia. Comencé a mis 14 años de edad, estudiaba en el colegio y trabajaba en una videotienda 
que había en la, en la iglesia cristiana. Ahí entonces ya comencé a conocer al Rabino Elad y tuvimos una relación, nos, nos comprometimos y fue entonces cuando nosotros nos casamos. Desde el primer momento en que él a mí me, me transmitió ese conocimiento de que Jesús no era el Mesías, de que era otra historia eh, y la, el pueblo de Israel y lo que Israel significaba para el mundo, a partir de ahí la mentalidad mía cambió y adquirí automáticamente todo ese conocimiento que él me transmitió y juntos comenzamos a llegar a nuestra comunidad. After the Geiris, Rabbi Elad and Karen married again a Yidei Chopa de Kedushin. And then they had two beautiful children, their older son Yitzchak and their younger daughter Raquel. When I asked them, how does it feel to have children who are born as full-fledged Yidin, Karen was overcome with emotion. de verlos crecer en la Torah, en las Misbot. Ellos saben que yo soy una mamá, que siempre estoy ahí con ellos. Hagas esto, haz esto, pilas, cumple la Torah, vale la pena. Y, y ver la respuesta tan positiva de mis hijos me hace muy feliz y una madre muy orgullosa. Y estoy dispuesta con mi esposo a hacer todo lo que sea necesario para garantizar una generación de familia judía, unos nietos judíos que ellos encuentren buenas parejas en su vida y que sigan con este legado de la Torah, de las Mizbot, de la comunidad y, y poder de verdad aportar al pueblo de Israel personas buenas, personas que amen la Torah. With such incredible parents, it's no wonder why their kids are so impressive. They're really proud to be children of Jewish leaders, and the older they get, The more they understand their parents' journey, the more respect they have for them. Nuestra roca. Ellos son los nuestra base a lo que nos ayudan a formar a grandes personas y a grandes judíos. Nosotros somos muy apegados a ellos, pero también somos muy independientes de nuestra parte. Tan, pero eso es lo que a nosotros nos motiva a crecer todos juntos, como lo que sería llamado una comunidad, la comunidad judía de Antioquia. It amazed me the level of responsibility they feel to be leading the community in their own way. Hay personas cuando llegan nuevas no tienen la fuerza para tener una vida judía como tal, de ir a rezar todos los días Shaharit, Minhar, Bid, estudiar Torah. Entonces ahí es donde entra mis padres y nosotros. Entramos a dar esa fuerza, ese apoyo. Este año estoy preparando el baile de Hanukkah con las niñas del Talmud Torah y también el otro año voy a comenzar un grupo de estudio para las niñas. I have never the, seen such the kids way in my he life. Looks at his that, well, I, yeah. Amazing. <laughs> Mom, American kids can learn a lot from these kids. For sure, the highlight of my trip was giving the entire community a gift from Rabbi Gedalia Zlatowicz. Before I came to Colombia, I called my friend Rabbi Gedalia Zlatowicz from Art Scroll, and I told him a little bit about the story, and I said, I'm going there now. How would you like to send each family a gift, a chumash, a Haggadah Shal Pesach, and a Siddur? And Rabbi Gedalia graciously agreed. Juby Charnowitz went to Art Scroll headquarters and picked up boxes and boxes of the Sfarim, and she and her family schlepped it to Colombia. On the last night of our trip, We arranged a meal for the entire community. Before we presented it to them, we each said a few heartfelt words, and then every family member stood in line to receive their chumash. Watching their excitement and their joy as they received it was their gift to me. Their enthusiasm for Torah and mitzvahs was contagious. They told me that even if they wanted, they couldn't afford to buy these farm. Aquí en Colombia, here in Colombia, 380, pesos. it cost 380,000 pesos, which That's is good. half a month's salary. And to have the opportunity to own their very own art scroll chumash meant the world to them and their families. I picked up the guitar and we started singing Esa Einai. <laughs> The room became so charged with emotion as everybody sang along. It felt like their souls were on fire. As I 
strummed the guitar and kept repeating the words, Esa Eina El Aharim, I lift my eyes to the mountains. I thought of how Aharim can also be read, Hehoirim, ancestors, and how their ancestors came to live in these mountains in Colombia trying to hold on secretly to their Yiddishkeit. And now, I'm sitting with their descendants who are singing from the deepest depths of their neshamas. Ezri Me'im Hashem, Oisei Shemayim Ba'aretz. One of the biggest struggles for this community has been acceptance. People constantly test, question, and doubt their motivations. They don't feel accepted into mainstream communities. When I asked Rabbi Elad, after sacrificing so much, how do you deal with rejection? His answer blew me away. Si nosotros creemos que somos descendientes de aquellos que fueron obligados a renunciar a su religión, y la Iglesia Católica preguntaba constantemente si esos judíos sí realmente se habían convertido al catolicismo. Ahora pareciera que fuera una inquisición a la inversa, porque la comunidad judía constantemente también está poniendo a prueba si nuestra conversión al judaísmo es real. Creemos firmemente que nuestras almas estuvieron en Harsina y recibiendo la Torá, y creemos firmemente en que todas esas cosas que nos, las puertas que se nos han cerrado, son las que nos han hecho crecer. Así que en vez de debilitarnos, esa oposición nos ha llevado a ser más fuertes y más decididos. Yeshaya Novi says that in the end of days, the Om Hashem Elohim Mekabitz Nidche Yisrael. Hashem who gathers all the scattered Jews, promises, Oid Akabitz Olav Lenik Batzav. I'll continue gathering those Yidden who are still scattered out there and add them to those who are already gathered. We see that Nevoah being fulfilled today, not just with Rabbi Elad's community, but with millions of Yidden who are now yearning and searching to come home. <laughs> Opening our hearts to them will bring the Geula one step closer as we get ready for Hashem to bring us all home. <laughs>